What is language endangerment? Well, first, let's talk about language vitality. We uh, There are a number of different scales that can be used to, to measure the vitality of languages. I'm going to be using the expanded, expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale. And here, these, these definitions come from Ethnologue. I know there are other organizations that do uh, language endangerment statistics, but these are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on today. So you can have languages, that, the, the, the ones on the screen right now are, are healthy, in, in healthy states, not endangered. So ranging from international languages that are used widely between nations and developing languages like uh, number five in vigorous use with literature in a standardized form being used by some, though this is not yet widespread or sustainable, to 6A vigorous used in face-to-face -face communication by all generations and the situation is sustainable. But then you get to the more concerning stages from 6B to 10. And this is what we're gonna be focusing on today. The And so 6B is threatened that the language is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it is losing users. And with regard to um, Jewish languages, that is the stage of Juhuri, which we'll talk about later. The next is shifting, which is the childbearing generation can use the language among themselves, but it is not being transmitted to children. So you see how transmission to children is a big part of these stage definitions, because that is how languages get transmitted. If, if it's transmitted from a parent to a child, then it is not in danger. Next, we have moribund, that the only remaining active users of the language are members of the grandparent generation and older, and many of the Jewish languages are in that stage. Next, and, and I'm going to ask you to mute, please, if you're uh, not talking, because there's some background noise. Next, we have 8B, nearly extinct. The only remaining users of the language are members of the grandparent generation or older who have little opportunity to use the language. And next is nine, dormant, uh, or I would also say infused can be in that category. The language serves as a reminder of heritage identity for an ethnic community, but no one has more than symbolic proficiency. And finally, 10, extinct, the language is no longer used and no one retains a sense of ethnic identity associated with the language. Um, now, a lot of language activists do not like to use that term extinct because they feel that there's always the possibility that it can become revitalized and so they prefer to use the term dormant. So these stages are not so black and white. Uh, the way that they're written, it, it makes it seem like it's easy to determine where a language is in within these stages. Like it says, the only speakers are of the grandparent generation. Well, what if there's one young person who speaks it? Like an example being Sam Miller, who is one of the few young people who speaks Lishan Didan. And so does is it no longer endangered because of Sam's knowledge of the language? Another issue is that, uh, and I think this really applies in the case of Jewish languages, is that sometimes the speakers of the endangered language acquire a standard language, but maintain elements of their ancestors' Jewish variety. You see this especially regarding Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Greek. The speakers of Judeo-Italian um, eventually picked up the standard language, as many people in Italy did, based on language policies there, and but they still maintain some elements of their ancestral Judeo-Italian. And so are they considered speakers of the language when you're counting? Same thing with Judeo-Greek, where they picked up standard Greek and used some elements of the Judeo-Greek, some of the distinctive features like Hebrew words that are used with uh, distinctive Greek pronunciations. So another issue, which we talked about last time, is language versus dialect. This is 
a huge problem when trying to count the number of languages in the world because when there are multiple varieties of, of a particular language let's say they're mutually intelligible so then they don't count as a separate language and what if you say okay well yiddish is not endangered because it's spoken by hasidim but what about the yiddish varieties that hasidim do not speak we certainly get that with uh, western yiddish which is considered to be an endangered language or Judeo Alsatian, and also uh, considered to be endangered. And, but what about, let's say, um, lang uh, Yiddish that is spoken not by any contemporary Hasidic group or, or Haredi non Hasidic group that is a particular dialect of Eastern Yiddish? Is that then considered to be an endangered language? Well, maybe it's an endangered dialect of a language that is not endangered. So that is the mutual intelligibility issue really complicates this question. Another complication is whether someone is a speaker or not. Do they have to be fluent to be considered a speaker? Do they have to actually use the language? What if they know it, but they can't uh, they don't have anyone to speak it with, or they there are people who speak the language, but they don't talk to each other. <laughs> um, and then what if someone is not fluent in the language, doesn't use it for primary communication, but engages with the language by learning it or by singing it? Are they considered to be a speaker when you're counting the number of speakers? So despite these complications, these statistics are still useful for us. And I'd like to add a, an additional angle to our conversation, which is Jeffrey Chandler's notion of post-vernacularity. This is a concept that he came up with when analyzing the way that contemporary people engage with the Yiddish language. They, he found that most people who use Yiddish words and talk about Yiddish outside of Haredi communities cannot understand full Yiddish sentences. And the fact that something is said in Yiddish is more significant than what is actually said. And we're not going to get into too much detail about that now, but it will likely come up, I think maybe in Brian's talk next time about Ladino, but really in all of the talks, there there might be, and, and this might be a question that you uh, ask the, in, the guest lecturers, what post-vernacular activity is there in the language that they're researching? So some examples of post-vernacular activity within um, contemporary uh, English-speaking countries is Yiddish words used within sentences or Yiddish tchotchkes, like souvenirs that, that people can buy that commodify the Yiddish language, like you know, little um, stuffed animals that have Yiddish words on them or Yiddish refrigerator magnets. There's also Yiddish performance, song and dance and puppet shows and uh, uh, visual art. And there's also translation, both translation of Yiddish literature into English and other languages, but also translation of various children's books in particular into Yiddish. And, and even though that might seem like a vernacular thing to do, which it also is and was, you know, the Yiddish Book Center has um, thousands of different um, titles that were translated from German, from French, from Russian, from English into Yiddish for people who needed those translations to access those works. But the translations that are happening today into Yiddish like let's say Winnie the Pooh and Redfish, Bluefish and Harry Potter, um, th they are useful for people who use Yiddish as a primary language, but most of the people who are using those books, buying those books are not actually first language speakers and could access those works in their English originals. So another aspect to post-vernacularity is metalinguistic community. This is a notion by Netta Avineri to describe what she found when she was researching Yiddish activities in California. 
And she found that there were Yiddish clubs and Yiddish uh, gatherings and classes where people gathered around this language, even though they didn't speak it. They would gather to celebrate Yiddish, but they would be primarily speaking in English. So with these new notions of um, post-vernacularity and metalinguistic community, let's take a look at the statistics on language vitality uh, among Jewish language, various Jewish languages. So first, we see that all of the languages listed here with their ethnologue statistics are listed in, in um, phases that are endangered. So from shifting in stage seven to extinct for Judeo-Provencal. And some, some of them are 8A or 8B. And the only ones that are not are Yiddish and Juhuri or judeo tat um, now you also might notice um, that the numbers are, there isn't just one number for some of them, there are multiple numbers. And that's because the statistics are given by country. So in some countries, these languages would be considered to be endangered, but in other countries, they would not. So Yiddish is not endangered in America, in Belgium, in Israel, but it is considered endangered in Lithuania and Belarus. And um, Judeo Tat or Juhuri is considered vigorous in one town in Azerbaijan called Kirmizi Kasaba, but it is considered to be threatened elsewhere in uh, Azerbaijan, in Dagestan, and in Russia, and in Israel, where many of the speakers moved. Uh, we also see that there, if we add post vernacular activity, we, we maybe feel a little bit more comfortable with, with these statistics because we see that there is some post-vernacular engagement with these languages, with, with some of these languages. There is a great deal of post-vernacular activity regarding Yiddish and regarding Ladino. And there is some, and I think a growing amount for Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tajik or Bukharian, Ju Judeo-Tat or Juhuri. And, um, and very little, so notice here, Judeo-Persian is listed, but I think really that term is meant to encompass Jewish Iranian languages more broadly, some of which are not even in the Persian family, but we'll learn more about that in, in a few weeks. Uh, and, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic, um, I think there, there is, oh, so there's very little uh, post vernacular activity in Jewish Iranian languages, but there is some in Jewish Neo Aramaic. Um, I, I wrote none for Judeo Berber, but I think there is a bit more now than there was a few months ago. Um, and um, we recently, the Jewish Language Project recently commissioned a music video using Judeo Berber or Amazigh in, uh, in the video. And uh, Judeo-Greek, we'll be learning about that. And um, again, the, the issue of who is considered a speaker, some might say that this language is extinct because there aren't people around who speak the way that it used to be spoken, but there are still some people who speak Greek in a distinctive way. And so are they considered speakers or not? And finally, Judeo-Provencal, where uh, the last speakers, um, were probably uh, died in, in the early 20th century or maybe even before that, but there was actually some post vernacular activity in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, after most people had shifted to the and the, um, and there even is some literature that involves some post vernacular activity then. So um, what makes a language endangered? Well, I created this image here. It's pretty complicated, but don't worry, I'm gonna go through it bit by bit. So uh, what I did here is I, I put in a bunch of factors that can lead to people not teaching their language to their children. And I divided them into internal and external factors. So, so First, let's take a look at um, some 
so assimilation. So um, the idea is that often, um, the, and, and there's really a continuum of forced to willful assimilation. And often this has a socioeconomic basis that people can get better jobs if they learn the dominant language. And what leads to that? Well, internal and external factors. Some external factors in the case, and here we're gonna talk specifically about the Jews in, in Europe first, um, that the uh, emancipation led to civil rights to, for that individual Jews had. It used to be that they were considered to be a communal body and were addressed as a communal body by the government of their country or by local leaders in, in the areas where they lived. But the emancipation led to individual civil rights. And this started in France in 1791 and moved north and eastward to the Netherlands, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany and Poland, etc. And this led to more education in the local language and access to jobs that Jews weren't allowed to hold previously. And so it makes sense that this would lead to some language endangerment. Also an internal aspect of assimilation is, or a factor in assimilation is the Haskalah, which is the Jewish version of the broader enlightenment in Europe. And that led to uh, Jews' desires not to speak the, langu the languages they considered to be backwards, but to write in Hebrew or to write in German or Russian or uh, other local languages. And um, that also led to some of the um, language endangerment that we're talking about here. Another uh, in another factor is mass migrations. What leads to mass migrations? Uh, well, there are two different types. There's within a country and from a country to other countries. So within a country, we had a lot of urbanization in not just in Europe, but also in Iran and in, in Morocco and other, other countries that where Jews moved from rural to urban areas, along with many other people in their countries. This was often part of the Industrial Revolution. And then the migrations from one country to another happened in all of these places that many Jews moved from Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa to Western Europe, the United States, Latin America, and eventually Israel. And they did this sometimes to escape poverty, discrimination, and violence, or sometimes um, for, for family reasons or, or other reasons. And obviously when you move to a new place, you are likely to lose your ancestral language within a few generations. Another external factor is genocide. And in the case of Jews, the Nazi Holocaust in uh, 1938 to 1945, killed many, many people, including 6 million Jews, mostly in Europe. And some of those spoke Jewish versions of standard languages like German and French, but most of the Jews killed spoke longstanding Jewish languages like Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Greek, and Krimchak. And Karaim, the Karaite Turkic language, was primarily spared in this in the Holocaust because they, uh, the community convinced the Nazis that they were not Jews. And so, but their language was um, very much de-Judaized during this period. And then in the 1950s, in the Soviet Union under Stalin, there were state-sponsored murders of Jews, including targeting Yiddish writers and actors. So it makes sense that genocide would lead to language uh, decline and perhaps endangerment. But another external factor is language policy. Language policy can refer to many things from um, what language is allowed to be used for education, for um, communicating with the government, for signage. And there are laws in many countries about that. 
sometimes the law says you have to have English and French on every sign, like in, in Canada, for example. Or sometimes it says you cannot use a certain language on public signage. Sometimes these language policies are part of nationalistic movements where the government is trying to unify the country by promoting linguistic unity. And this goes back to um, notions of um, nationalism that, that are centered around language, that if your country doesn't have a unified national language, then it's, it's not um, aligned with some of the other nationalistic movements in Europe. Uh, and we see this in Europe, Iran, Israel, and the United States in particular, where the government, real, the governments in these, in many of these places, made rules about having to use certain languages in in classrooms. A another aspect of language policy is about writing systems, and we see this in Turkey in the early twentieth century when um, Ataturk said, uh, ruled that Turkish has to be written in Latin letters rather than in the historical Arabic writing system that it used to use. The same thing happened for Ladino or Judeo-Spanish there, that it was no longer written in Hebrew letters, but now written in Latin letters. And we also see um, major um, policy requirements in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, where the Soviet government said that Jews could not, well, not just Jews, but everyone had to write their languages first in Latin letters and then in Cyrillic letters. And this particularly applied to uh, Juhuri or Judeo Tat and to Bukharian. And um, for, so, for example, with Juhuri, initially it was written in Hebrew letters, and then it was it, the next alphabet was Latin, and then Azerbaijani Cyrillic letters. So, coming back to this this uh, model that I that I put up before, we see that all of these internal and external factors lead to. Um, a few things. One is the prestige of the new local language after a migration or after it's imposed through educational systems, and the stigma of the old language. That is because of perhaps economic disparities or language policies or discrimination, the language that the community spoke before is no longer considered to be um, positive or is maybe it never was but um, the negatives are outweighing the positives now and then these factors of prestige and stigma lead to and all these other factors lead to parents speaking a new language to their children or maybe they still speak that language to their children but the children reject the parents language and start speaking a new language and then eventually the last speaker of that language dies, which means that the language is now dormant. So let's see. So to sum up the historical factors that led to the decline of longstanding Jewish language varieties, from the 18th to 20th centuries, we have emancipation, nationalism, and urbanization and uh, enlightenment. And in the 20th century, we have the Holocaust and Stalinism. From the 19th to the 21st centuries, we have migrations to the Americas, to Israel, to Western Europe. And we have uh, parents in all of these periods using other languages with their children, which leads to the decline of the original languages. And just to give you some examples of the migrations, I know this is a messy map, and that's because it's a messy migration. There, there are migrations from various places to various places. You see from um, many places to um, Israel or Palestine, which eventually became Israel, and from many places to the Americas and to other parts of the former British Empire from North Africa to France and Western Europe, 
from Germany to Sweden. Uh, so all of these different migrations led to not only language endangerment, but the creation of new language varieties. So we have, as we spoke about last time, Jewish English, but we also have Jewish Latin American Spanish and Portuguese, and we have Jewish Swedish, and we have Jewish German and Russian and Hungarian and uh, French. And, and so I would say that all of these languages or language varieties are thriving and developing, but the longstanding Jewish language varieties are now primarily endangered. And that is the case for Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Jewish Neo-Aramaic, Jewish Malayalam, Judeo-Median and other Iranian Jewish languages, Judeo-Tat or Juhuri, and Judeo-Tajik or Bukharian. And of course, Yiddish is not endangered because of its continued use in Hasidic communities where it is transmitted to the younger generation, but other varieties of Yiddish are endangered like Western Yiddish, Judeo-Alsatian, and some other varieties of Eastern Yiddish. So in conclusion, most longstanding Jewish language varieties are moribund. And in the next 20 to 30 years, the last speakers will likely die with some possible exceptions. So now is the time to take care of this issue, to document these language varieties and the cultures and histories that surround them. And now is also the time to share that knowledge. Why? Well, first for speakers who want their languages to be preserved, like Simon Mardechayev, who lives in New York, but is originally from Azerbaijan and is a speaker of Juhuri and has worked with language uh, documentation organizations to preserve his language and to share that information with others. For some, it's too late. For example, for Sarah Cohen from Cochin, India, who was one of the last speakers of Jewish Malayalam and unfortunately passed away a few years ago. It's, it's also important for academia, for scholarship. We need to have uh, documentation of these languages so that they can be studied by future scholars and by students who wish to learn the languages. And it's also useful for Jews around the world. When Jews around the world know about other Jews around the world, it makes them feel more like part of a world Jewish community. And it's also useful for groups outside the Jewish community, for indigenous groups, immigrant groups, religious groups, and others who might look to Jewish communities to see how their languages are being documented and being reclaimed and revitalized. And we who are documenting and revitalizing endangered Jewish languages can look to indigenous and immigrant communities to see how they are doing this work as well. And we can, I mean, the more we share resources about this, the better off all of our work will be. So how is this work being done? Well, at the Jewish Language Project, we have convened the Jewish Language Consortium, where we bring together several organizations that do in endangered language documentation and education about various Jewish languages. And there are many other organizations out there that do this work. Uh, for example, Brian Kirshen is known as the Ladino linguist, and he's doing a lot of the work to document and, and educate about Ladino or Judeo-Spanish. And um, the, uh, but just to give you a little bit more information about the Jewish Language Project, our mission is to promote research on awareness about and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And we do this in many ways, give you a few examples of some of our current projects. We are currently documenting endangered Iranian Jewish languages. We post fun facts on social media. So if you don't yet follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and YouTube, or at least one of those, then I recommend you uh, do that. And 
and you'll get two fun facts every week. One, one fun fact about a language or multiple languages and one word of the week. And we're currently working on an exhibit about Jewish languages with ANU, Museum of the Jewish People, formerly known as Beit HaTfutzot in Israel. We're also working on creating curricular resources for Jewish day schools and religious schools. And as of, I think, Friday, we are now officially doing another project. We're creating a multilingual Omer counter. That is all for now.